Good morning, Guadalupe. Right? This is 92.7 FM Radio, Arrow FM. And this program today is called Aging with Attitude. My name is Anthony Aporo. And today I have uh, two guests with me Tam from Alzheimer's Wadarapa and Susie from Age Concern. Um, Susie, because of St. Patty's Day, would you like to uh, read out the I, Irish prayer? I certainly would. I actually heard on the way um, in this morning that it's um, St. Patrick's Day, um, so I thought I'd read an Irish blessing. Um, may the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. So um, a nice thought for St. Patrick's Day. I just wish that you did that in an Irish accent. Arr. Okay, I'll try again. No, I won't. <laughs> it might sound something else. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's a good start to the show anyway. Um, what was it again, the first verse? Oh, stand by, caller. Um, let me see. May the road rise up to meet you. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind always be at your back. Yeah, it sounds beautiful. Mm. It sounds beautiful. We have all different types of issues during life, and if we can hold on to something like that to say, well... You know, there's going to be a time where it's going to be okay for us. You know, you know, we can hold that and move forward. And be positive. <laughs> Cause there, there's a little song I wrote. I like to sing it note for note. Don't worry. Is that right? Be, be happy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good morning, Tam, and thank you for joining us today. It's wonderful to have you on our show today. Um, just one of the reasons is because we work so well closely together, age, concern, and Alzheimer's wider up. So, welcome. So, the same population? <laughs> <laughs> yes. We work with the same population? Yep. So, um, in terms of what you do, Tim, what, do you, what is dementia? What is that all about? Because I've had people say to me, my, um, my whanaunga has got mm. dementia, but haven't got Alzheimer's or they've got Alzheimer's, but it hasn't gone to dementia yet. Mm. So there seems to be a little bit of uncertainty uh, about what is dementia. I know, and I want a buck for every time I've been asked that question. <laughs> I'd be really rich and wouldn't be working with dementing people if that was the case. Um, so Alzheimer's is dementia. Dementia is like the umbrella term and Alzheimer's is a type of dementia. And so if your person has Alzheimer's or any other type of dementia, it's all dementia. It's just a type. And it cues us in as to how it's likely to, how the journey's likely to go if we know what type of dementia someone's got. Okay, well... Okay, so it's, I suppose it's like having a Holden mm -hmm. car. Dementia is the Holden, <coughs> the, the brand. And then Chimera uh, and all those different, Calais, Barina is the different types. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. What are those different types? So there's hundreds. Hundreds? <laughs> we, we haven't got time today to go and go that far. <laughs> but mostly pe doctors, uh, um, GPs, people that might diagnose will only use like six of them and now what's a bet I can only remember five of them or something like that so you've got Alzheimer's it's the most common so most people will be diagnosed with Alzheimer's then you've got um, like a vascular type dementia so if the person has had um, a stroke or or ha is having a stroke or um, heart issues then they start to decline cognitively, then they might. The doctors might say it's a it's a vascular type dementia. Okay. So, um, so with that, um, Tim, <coughs> does it mean to say that um, the blood flow is not getting to the brain? Is is that why? Yeah. It's so it's vascular? the brain is starting to fail because it's no oxygen got a bit to the dying brain. off. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> and so, so if we've got an Alzheimer's type dementia, you might just do a slow, steady decline. Okay. If you've got a vascular type dementia, it sort of goes down in steps. So something might happen, like you might get a, um, you might get an infection, a urinary mm -hmm. tract infection or a chest infection, something like that, and you'll decline. And then you might recover from the infection, but cognitively you don't quite get back to where you were. 
Okay. All right. So, so you go down in steps. Okay. As in terms of your deterioration. Yeah. Um, then you've got something uh, a Lewy body type dementia, which is different again and has some of the same symptoms as the other dementias, but also commonly has um, hallucinations and and often those people are also prone to falling. Okay. Tripping. Yeah. Okay. So that's quite serious, really, yeah. <clears throat> because we could put down, down, say, the Louis body one where you say they fall over and they're prone to falling. Mm. Uh, we could just think that they were just being unbalanced. Yes. Not realising that actually something else is happening. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. Or they see things that you don't see and no one around <clears throat> them, no one else sees them either. Mm -hmm. Now they've got a, a different type of mental health issue because we think that... Yeah. Something else is going on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, these are things that are really good to, to know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, that's three of the many, hundreds of different types of dementia. But um, most people will get an Al Alzheimer's type dementia. Yeah. I've heard about in terms of Alzheimer's, and, I, and you can help me in this one here, Tim, because, you know, it's just someone saying something, but you could put clarity to it. They said to me in terms of Alzheimer's, um, one of the reasons why Alzheimer's affects people is because it tempts to like being in a forest and having a forest. Yeah. And the forest is your um, neurons, your cells. Okay. Okay. And he said um, that with Alzheimer's, one of the reasons why people get Alzheimer's is because uh, there's a plaque that is, it sits <coughs> outside the cell and it affects the other cells. And so he said, it's like a forest, then you have all these dead trees there. Yeah. And also this, this parasite or whatever it is, virus, whatever it is, uh, starts killing the other trees. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, that's a really good, powerful explanation is to see a green forest, then you see all these different trees dying away mm. because of well, the... I think they call them plaques and tangles. <coughs> yeah. Um, yes, well, that is a good way of describing it it is um and no two people everybody's journey is different yeah so no two people will you may not get all the symptoms yeah so as soon as someone's diagnosed one of the first things the family does oh she's never gonna she's gonna forget me she won't know who i am yeah. and i had a man um whose wife was dementing recently and he said i am not putting her in a home and until she doesn't recognize me and i said but that may never happen because on some level she might always recognise you. She might not as well, but yeah. if if that's your benchmark for putting someone into a home or defining when you can't cope, it might never happen, and you might not be coping, yeah. and she's still remembering you. You, you talked before, Tim, about um, plaques and tangles. Mm. What's tangles? I have no idea, <laughs> to be fair. Do you know, Susie? Aren't they um, some they, form of protein that, that's are, in our brain? A collection of protein. Yeah. Um, but I'm just trying to, fiercely trying to think of a way where I can describe it in layman's terms. It's like little hairy things, isn't it? Like yeah. little. Oh, I and, get it. Mm. So they're in, your, um, in the cells and they grow and they like a big so you know, they, the, <clears throat> a scourging cloth. Scouring. Scouring cloth. Yes. That you wash the dishes. And it stops magnet or electrical and impulses coming through. Yeah. yeah. So it slows everything down and actually sometimes it doesn't doesn't it doesn't it stops the the electricity or the information going from one cell to another. Oh wow. Um yeah. Yeah. So you've got this big mess. Like mess. bad hair day. Bad hair day. <laughs> Put the camera over on Susie. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so a fair ball. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good illustration. Mm. Is that close to it, or could it, be? Close? It is. It is. The thing with us at Alzheimer's is we don't focus too much on those things yep. because we actually most of our work is troubleshooting what's not going right. Okay. And we so so and when I do an education session, I don't go well. This is the brain, and mm. when this symptom happens, this is what part of the brain is being affected because that is of no use absolutely mm. no use to any of the carers mm. they don't care and um they just want it fixed yeah yeah so okay how are we going to approach this 
And and I have to say that 90% of my job, not 90, that's a huge exaggeration, but is teaching women in particular not to be nagging wives. Oh. Mm. Because you can imagine when you start, your brain is failing and you're starting to get things wrong or not right or can't remember and someone is correcting you all day, no, no, stop, no, that's not right, don't, no, where are you going, no, you're not doing that wrong. You can imagine if I, even with us, with fully functioning brains, should I do this to you all day? <laughs> because usually, you know, you're looking at an older population, they're retired, spending a lot of time together. It's usually spouses um, <coughs> being told, no, don't. I've, you've got it wrong again, you've failed again, remember I told you yesterday, mm. those sort of things, that eventually someone will snap. Whether it's the nagger or the naggy, someone will, will snap eventually. You know, I really, I really liked what you said there, Tim, because a lot of the times um, there is focus on the person who's dementing, Yeah. but also um, we should pay a lot of um, time to those are the carers yes so teaching them that they have the fully functioning brain mm. and they can adapt so they can let some things slide you don't have to fight every battle or cor- you know you don't have to be right every time sometimes you can just be kind and let it slide yeah i i heard once when one person um their mother said i'm going to play tennis today well she's in her 80s yep. um she hasn't played tennis for 60 years and the daughter said, uh, Mum, you don't play tennis. Mm. And then there was a big argument. It just blew up. Yes, because you haven't played tennis for years. <coughs> yes, I have. I played last week. Yeah. It goes like <laughs> we that. like that. We like that too. And, and at some point, someone has to give in. Someone has to pull back. And the person with the less functioning brain is not the person that can necessarily pull back. Mm. Um, but the person with the fully functioning brain should actually pull back mm. so it's but it's not a natural thing to do either so um so part of my a lot a big part of my job is teaching people actually if the world doesn't stop turning because of that statement then you let it slide if, the, if nothing bad is going to happen so so what if we say oh yeah that tennis would be great today mm. sunny out there nice day for a game let's yeah. find a tennis court <laughs> The brother came in and said to uh, her, the mother, uh, Mum, well, can you go and find the tennis rackets? And we'll go out and play. And so she, I think she went out, but she couldn't find the tennis rackets, but she was fine with that. Yes, but got distracted <coughs> while yes. finding the tennis rackets onto something else, and then mm. life has come again. Life has come again. Yeah. Yeah, so a big part of our jobs is keeping everyone just so. Yeah. What kind of support systems are there for the carer? For the carer. So I I have two support groups. So I, initially when I came to the job, there was one, and it was predominantly women. Now I could get a man to that support group once, and then they'd say, yeah, nah, Tam, can't do this. And then I, and I was like, why, can't, why won't men stay at this support group? And then I sat back and I watched the ladies. And to be fair, when I say it's a support group, it's a loose term. Um... But the woman, someone will say, my husband started wandering in the middle of the night. And those women dive on that, <laughs> or dive on that issue. And they say, well, this is what I did. And they've got all them. They look at it from every angle. And they've got all the worldly advice um, where a man will come and just, where do I start? What, give me a place to start. How can we fix this? Oh, he's a Martian. Yeah, just <laughs> tell me where to start. And... He doesn't want to look at it from all angles. He doesn't care why it's happening. Just tell me how to fix it or tell me how we can live with it. Yep. Um, so that is why men wouldn't come, and, well, they wouldn't stay at the support group. So now we have the, a woman's support group for women who care for people with dementia and a men's support group. And that's very different. And very, the f- woman will predominantly come and they say, how can we keep our person... Um, at home for as long as possible. The whole focus is keeping the person at home. The men, their very first support group, I said, right, what do you guys want to know? What's gonna, what do you want to know about? Or what are we going to troubleshoot today? How's this going to be helpful? 
and they said, want to know, how do you apply for the subsidy and at what, when will I know to, when to put my wife mm. into care and how will I know how to choose a good place? So total different focus on yeah. like they're quite re- men are quite realistic that eventually one day I won't be able to do this, mm. and women are like I will do this forever. <coughs> so yeah. we're the, quite maternal and yeah, mothering and yeah. used to mothering. We've mothered all our kids and mm. and women don't give in that no. easily at all. Hmm. Oh, that's what about um, other than the support groups you talk about? <coughs> should they need help? Um, like finding out information of what, where is a good um, rest home or how do I get them into a rest home? Yep, so we, we can do that. We, we So the minute the person is referred to us, and it, we take referrals anyway, they come. So you don't have to go through a health professional, you can drop in at my office, you oh, can okay. phone us, and I'll come and see your person. They may not have even had a diagnosis yet, um, and that's okay because we see people who have a cognitive decline, and it might might not necessarily end up being dementia, but there seems to be no uh, nowhere else for these people to go. So we, So you don't need a diagnosis to come to us, and you can phone us, pop in, Go through your doctor. We do get referrals from the hospital, from uh, GP practices. So that's... I've lost the original question. <coughs> so before we go on to the original question, where are you? We're at the Solway Showgrounds in the Doug Lamb building. Uh, so that's the corner of Fleet and York Street. Okay. So the original question was around how do I get my... Um, demented person help in terms of oh, how so c- come to us and 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 so from the point of in- entering our service then we walk you through how to cope at home um we, we do home visits um, it's only me by the way and i'm part-time <laughs> <laughs> so so, so okay first, first so thing, I go and what see day the person. are you there so they we know work, what day tuesdays i work tuesdays wednesdays Fridays, um, we're about to get a new admin lady, so the our the office hours will all, we'll, we'll always be shut Mondays, but in the near future, so in the next six weeks, our office will be open in the mornings. Hopefully, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Okay. In the mornings, <coughs> there'll be someone manning the office, and I'm in and out, in between home visits and um, community education and stuff like that. So. I get the referral, I go and see the person and I go and see the person in their own home because I don't care that they can keep a lid on it in my office for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, an hour. It's no use to me. I want to see how you function in your own home, what you can do, what you can't do. I want to hear from your family, what are they finding problematic? What is the person finding problematic? We can, you know, just troubleshooting. And then it might be that... um, that we look at putting supports in. So then I'll do referrals to Focus. Um, and I kind of like to do that early because Focus likes Focus is a needs assessment department at the hospital and they like to know the person early and put the supports in gradually as needed. Okay, yeah. And people may or may not need um, rest home care at the end of the journey. And it's not a... Well, most people will die in their own homes. Oh, okay, yeah. <coughs> Without having the need for a rest home. But some people need to go into a rest home. And then it's a matter of deciding, helping focus decide where's the best place for this person. Do they, will they cope or will the rest home cope with them in a rest home situation? Are there more physical needs as the person's aged, in which case they might need a hospital level um, care where there's always a nurse? Or is the dementia still the main problem and are they active enough to walk out the doors because you know what these rest times are like they have these automatic doors so if you're dementing and you stand in front of those doors well they open automatically and that's an invitation to walk through and if the rest home can't contain you there's going to be big trouble because they don't want to end up on the front page of the times age and um you know, with that big headline that they've failed to look after their elderly people. Mm. So, in which, so if the person is wandering or somewhat challenging, it might be that they live in a secure dementia unit. 
which sounds like one flew over the cuckoo's nest, but I can assure you it is literally a rest home with secure doors. So you can. The difference is the doors don't open automatically. Yes. <laughs> and so you can go inside and outside as often as you like. You just cannot leave the facility without someone. Yeah. Well, that's reassuring for the families as well. Yeah. Because, you know, when if someone got lost, you'd be beside yourself. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You'd be beside you. And I know that my family, anyway, would do a haka kukapana pana from the East Coast. It's a. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's what they would do. But it's good to know that it's just a um, rest home where the doors can't open. Yeah, the person can't leave the grounds. Yeah. They can go inside and outside. Because you think, when you say they need a secure unit, families are just mortified. And they go, oh, no, not that, because they all think one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Yeah. And there's no Jack Nicholson in New Zealand to release everyone. So <laughs> <laughs> The other thing is, if you're in a secure unit, does not mean you never leave that unit. This, the facility mm. will take you out and you still do all the rec activities and the van rides and the trips out. and um, They still do all of that. People get to leave the premises, but they get to leave with staff. Do, um, does Alzheimer's Wairarapa have a, um, an activities day? or? Yep, so we run a day activity program called Iona. Um, and it's currently it's Tuesdays and Fridays. We're hoping to increase that by a day. Not sure what day it will be, but in some time before the end of the year, if if Omicron, Omicron allows, we're hoping to ha- introduce a third day. But day activities is as much for um, the carer as it is for the person. So it has to be fun because the person has to want to go. Yeah, and the carer can then. Um, have two days a week Tuesdays and Fridays where they can go to the bank or they can get a haircut or they can do any of those things that they can't do with their person Yeah, it's the um, get out of jail free card for carers Yeah, it it must be good for the carers because you know it's their time to be released I suppose you could put it in their terms so so I I, I used to always harp onto the um, carers about how to keep doing things, keep taking your people out, keep giving them opportunities to interact with others, even though their ability might be lessened. At you know the communication might not be as good as it was, but still give those opportunities because it's one of the things that helps stave off symptoms. And the carers said to me, "Well, you always say that, and because the first thing when you've been diagnosed, you naturally want to be a bit more recluse." And um, so it's about getting people out and about and doing things and living life and having quality. And the carers would say, well, you always say with a diagnosis, um, our, the people who have got the diagnosis are marred really um, and prisoners in their own homes at times, sometimes by choice. And there's a handbrake on the social life. And they said, but you forget when there's a handbrake on their social life, there's a handbrake on my social life. Because now I'm at home, not able to do things, not able necessarily to leave the person at home. And so part of, this, part of the support group was getting, um, allowing carers to go out and do social things, normal everyday things. Um, or just catch their breath. <clears throat> catch their breath and... Not, like, not necessarily stay at home and wallow, even though the person's not there. It's an opportunity to get out and do things and keep your own networks going Mm -hmm. and get things done without having to think of where the person is or, you know, or sitting at the bank, organising finances and then having (laughs) someone chip in. (laughs) Not so realistic ideas. No. Yeah. 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 I I always think about what you said in terms of we call them carers, but we don't help them to self care. That's right. And if they don't look after, it's a bit like when you're on a plane and you have to put your own oxygen mask on first. Yeah. Um, if you're not good, nobody's good, really. And as you said um, in the beginning of the show, that um, and I'm going to use females here as the example that you used that they will tend to um, be more um, wanting to do things because that's the nature Mm. of caring and nurturing um, 
generally speaking, for a female. And so they will go that 200 miles further than they need to because it's in their nature to do that. Oh, to the point of their own detriment. Yeah. Like, I can remember I was... I knew that a person was... I was working in a, in a dementia unit, um, a secure one, and I knew I was admitting a man sometime that morning, and they arrived, and I rang the doctor and I said, are you sure I'm admitting the man? Because the wife seems more demented than the husband. And he goes, no, no, you are. You're admitting the husband. I said, are you sure? He's more realistic and more... less anxious. And... Anyway, I admitted the man and the wife would visit regularly and over three months we finally <coughs> started to see who the woman really was because oh, she had nearly burnt herself out yeah. and she had worse symptoms than him by the time she was putting him into care and appeared more demented than him. And then over three months and she got her life together and she started re-engaged with all the things that she used to before he got diagnosed and she's a total different woman in three months yeah but really literally she was burnt out yep. from uh, over caring if you like yeah and not looking after herself yes not can't see the herself. forest for the trees yeah yeah i have have heard um some people say also, Tam, that um, with the demented person, when will they get better? When will they get better? Because they see it as a disease, and you just take some pills, and you're fine after a while. Is that the case, or what is the case? No, it's not the case. They won't. They so they may go on medication early on. So there's lots of there's anti-dementia drugs that can be used, and and they for some people they work. And for others, they don't make a blind bit of difference. What do you mean they work? What do you well, mean? they slow down symptoms and just slow it give down? the person clarity and the person appears not so confused. And um, some people, like I, I've had a family say, mum's been on this medication for three months now and we've got mum back. Yeah. And other people will say it's not making a blind bit of difference. It's, it's down, you have to. Probably it's a good idea to give it a go. Some people can't stand the side effects that they might may experience, and other people don't get side effects at all. Okay. And you don't know until you try it. Like any drug. Yeah. Like any drug. But they will still dement just slowly. Is that so? So the anti-dementia drugs, are, um, they if they work, they work, and if you tolerate taking them, um, it'll stave off symptoms. Okay. But you're, you're buying time. Oh, okay. Yep. So it might be that you get two or three clearer years than you would have gotten. Okay. Yeah. So it is a terminal illness? Yes. Okay. You can die of dementia. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. You can die of anything, you know, in the meantime, but still yeah, be yeah. dementing, but you can also die of dementia. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it is a terminal illness. Yeah. And so in some, in terms of slowing it down, so you talked about medication. Yep. Is there, like, in the early stages, is there anything that we can do to help s slow that other than medication? Yes. So whatever is good for your heart is good for your brain. Oh, so yes. You eat well, you exercise regularly. Getting the person to do the things they do. So... If they're driving when they're diagnosed, it doesn't automatically mean we've got a diagnosis of dementia, you can't drive now. Because that person driving actually sits in your long-term memory and if you think of all the people that you've known who have had Alzheimer's, the short-term memory is shot, but the long-term memory is there for quite a while. Um, so their ability to drive is there as long as it's automatic. They're still safe to drive, but... Um, it's a contentious e um, issue, driving with well, a diagnosis dementia. of dementia. Yeah. It appears to be something that um, GPs have got onto um, recently as well from, from the work that we've done with people dementing. Um, and the process is quite involved and, um, you know, people get referred to um, to do actual an actual driving assessment, um, which can be quite... 
a worry. I know that if I know that um, I'm going to be assessed on something, it actually um, increases my anxieties. And um, when you've got, um, you know, the onset of dementia, um, it can exacerbate the whole way that they deal with that. So, yeah, it's important to make sure, you know, like we that we fully inform people and try and support them going through those processes as much as we can um, to keep them calm and carry on I guess as much, as well as they can mm. for as long as they can and yep. if I always say as long we'll keep doing this and you can keep driving until it's while it's safe and viable after that we're going to have to look at taking your license I'm not lying you may lose it before you lose your life but um, as long as it's automatic mm. do you find it um, when you have that conversation with them in terms of the driving yeah. Uh, and say, you know, you there's a high probability that you will lose your license. Is there a loss and grief process that comes with that? Oh, when it's taken. No, so so I never tell them that there's uh, let's let's talk about the fact that you might lose your license. We I don't go there until it is on the table. Okay. Um so usually what happens is a GP will do a cognitive test or he'll get his nurse at the practice to do a cognitive test on the person and depending on the score he will um, if, if, for some GPs and it's different <coughs> for everyone so what you need to know is that GPs have no guidelines on to when is the best point to take someone's licence or should they Oh, okay. So there's no, they have no guidelines it's, that's why there's a lot of variance because there's a lot of GPs working in, out in the wire wrapper so um, usually when it becomes an issue for me is when the person's been to the GP, done the cognitive test, scored rather low and the GP has said, well, we have to take your licence now. And um, some will, <laughs> the normal thing is, I have a perfect driving record. <laughs> I've never had an There's not a bent panel in my car. How dare he? The other thing I point out as well, <laughs> he's taken it if you continue to drive, and believe me, a lot do. Um, if you continue to drive and someone hits you, you now have no insurance. You might not have been the cause of the accident, but, but you still have no insurance. Yeah. And they, that always makes people think. Um, but there are lots of people out there who have had their licence taken off them, but they are still driving. Um, until they can get their head around the fact that or they start to lose confidence in themselves, or they might have had a close call, or um, their spatial judgment sometimes goes so so that while the driving is is a borderline to being okay, parking the car in the garage and not hitting the side of the mm. garage, um, those sort of things start happening. And when people start to bang up their cars, they start to lose confidence. Yeah. Yeah, not necessarily. Some people don't notice they've banged up the cars and I've gone to visit and noticed that there's not a straight panel on the car. Oh, wow. Um, and they say, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> the other thing is that I don't often get notified that people have lost their licence. Like, GPs are not going to say, I've just taken somebody so-and-so's licence off them. So quite often I don't know that they've lost their licence. Oh, OK. So I, my job is, luckily, not to be the driving police. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Because there are police for that. <laughs> but it is my duty to report it should I mm. notice that it's not safe any longer. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It would be pretty scary yeah. going to a person's place and seeing their panels of their car <laughs> dented and they don't know why it's happened. Yeah. Yeah, that's really scary. Not only for um, them, but also for yourself as being a road user. Yeah. Yeah. So another question I have, Tam, is in terms of... Um, what could some of the signs be for early onset? Now, the reason why I ask this question is because I, I play, um, I like doing Sudoku and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. sometimes an ad comes up, and I play it on, on online, okay? And an ad will come up, and they'll say, um, this will help you stave off dementia because of you being actively using your brains or building mm -hmm. neurological pathways. Yeah. I don't know if that's true or not. So if you do Sudoku, you're a numbers person, right? Yep. Yep. So so what I, so learning new things is um, and, and challenging your brain and making it pop. You want it always to be make, popping. Um, 
uh, other ways to stave off symptoms, right? So, but if you're the person that's done the crossword in the new daily newspaper and you get really annoyed if you can't get it out in three minutes, um, doing the crossword is not challenging your brain because you've done it every day for the last three decades. Oh, okay. So for you, it's not the crossword, it's Sudoku. So mm. you doing Sudoku is not challenging your brain because mm. one, you like doing it and you're a numbers person. Mm. But the challenge might be if you picked up the crossword and tried to do that. Okay, so what you're talking about is you um, being involved in different activities to spark yes. new things. Yes, making your brain think. On a diff- different ways. Yeah, because we get really lazy. Like, like if you were to brush your teeth, you, you pick up the brush and usually it's in your mm. dominant hand and you brush your teeth and you don't even think about it. You've got that brush working that in the, away in, the, in your mouth, not thinking, but you automatically know how hard to push and how far to push back and and you probably do it the same way every day. But if you were to put your toothbrush in your non-dominant hand and, well, you have to think about it. You have to think, oh, what angle do I put the brush? How far back do I push? Ouch, that was too far. Um, <laughs> you come back you're making your brain it. think in a way that it doesn't <laughs> normally have to think because we're lazy and we do things automatically and we do them how we do them. Yep. This is how I've always done it. This, And so... So, so challenging yourself is like do that every day this week for the rest of the week, Anthony. Brush your teeth in your non-dominant hand and see how that goes. Oh, I'm your pretty good. Brain, at, I'm pretty good at that. I because I'm ambidextrous, so whichever is closest, I'll well, use. So you do it. <laughs> I think that might be a challenge for me. Um, I think Anthony might be telling a few fibs. <laughs> He's a male. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't want to have holes in my, my yeah, mouth yeah. or bring my tonsils Or peel the potatoes with the peeler in your left hand yes. if you're right-handed. Or, yeah. um, that means I, don't, I won't have to buy those brush with those washed potatoes then. No, you'll have to buy dirty potatoes that yeah. you need to wash with your left hand. <sighs> they'll be cheaper. They'll be cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else can you do? So I did this exercise in one of my education. I did it for years about, and, and it is asked, um, so the GPs will often ask you to do this. If you're going for your licence, you know how, if, is it after you're 75 or after you turn 80, you've got to be regularly tested and you have a physical 75, I think and, and a cog- cognitive test. Um, and they sometimes ask you to, you know, because going forwards we can, we can, like that, it's always in sevens. I don't know. Se- sevens a magic number. So they say start at a hundred and go backwards in sevens. So we're hundred ninety three. And I did this um, this e- this activity with students for about four years before I realised that I wasn't even getting my um, answers correct. Answers correct. And nobody corrected me. Nobody said, "Hey Tam, you can't do maths." <laughs> Which well, is true. You, I can't. Did you mark them, and they didn't um, want to get their no, marks reduced? So it's reduced? not a speed test. But if you st- if we start at hundred, we go ninety three. Come on, you can help me out. Ninety three. Eighty six. My fingers. Seven. Eighty six. Seventy nine. Seventy two. Uh, Sixty five. Yeah. You like that. Yeah. But yeah. it's much e- <laughs> like you know, it's much easier. <laughs> going forward because I, even I can do that and I can't do maths so it's 7, 14, 21, 28 it's yep. simple yeah. but, they, but going backwards so you're making your brain think in a way that mm. it's not naturally inclined to do mm. Yeah. so that is keeping your brain popping which is what we want it doing mm. you know there comes two negative numbers in the end eh? they test it doesn't end in zero I've never got down to that far. There's <laughs> yeah. never enough time in an education session to go right down for me because, as I said, it's not a speed test. You've just got to make your brain pop and yeah. think. Um, what else is good for staving off? Oh, so, so I read things about learning new languages and think, and and picking up a musical instrument. And, and I say that to, to people, oh, well, you could always learn a new language or pick up a new instrument and learn that and they're like oh as if I'm going to start that at 90 dear <laughs> <laughs> let's be real here and it's true like you're either inclined to do it or you're not there's other people that will read that and immediately do it but for the gen- most commonly nobody wants to do it um, What I'm trying to think of what else we tell people to do to help um, stave off symptoms keep social because the first thing you're going to be inclined to do because because you'll have at some level you'll have an inclination that you're not getting it right as often as you used to and it makes people less confident and then they withdraw but we actually want people out there doing it still living their lives still socializing and and remaining social what about um 
doing new recipes or a lot of us, you know, um, as we get older, do try and um, keep up the cooking skills, um, yeah. learning new recipes or just being able to read recipes. Um, yeah. Sometimes I think as we get older, we just make the same things um, day to day in our busy worlds. But as you get older, if you've got more time to sit down and you know, maybe, maybe do meal planning or, you know, what do I need for this to go you know, to go to the supermarket and get different items that I wouldn't normally buy? Where would they be at the supermarket? We know the supermarket is always changing where things seem to be. And, and um, I mean, that could be a good challenge for people. Mm, mm. New products, new, yeah. new packaging and things. Mm. So you try, yeah. I liked what you said there, Tim, when you said, you know, your brain needs to pop. Mm. Yeah, you have to yeah. keep it popping. Yeah, you have to keep it popping because, as you said, we try do things, new things as human beings uh, that are automatic. Yes, because yeah. we're lazy. Mm. But we do it how we do it because that's how we do it. Yeah, <laughs> and so new learnings, you know, yeah. will make your brain pop. New learnings. Yeah. Yeah, whatever that might be. So it could be in any context. I've been, um, music therapy is great because music, um, uses both sides of your brain so you firing on both sides um, and there's lots of musical activities you can do because and I notice that people that have lost their ability to speak fluently or at all can still sing so you pop on it but you have to pop on a song that will trigger and mm. once they're triggered they can sing and everyone's going oh, I haven't heard words come out of that person's mouth in years and here they are singing mm. and um so music is always good too, music activities. Yeah. It just reminded me, like, um, with my mum, um, my cousin said to me, because we did the same thing, she was in a, at the marae and they were playing um, high marks, okay? And then she started singing mm. because she knew their songs and my cousin said to me, oh, you're telling lies because auntie's so good. Mm. And for, in that moment she is and in that context she is yeah. too. Because the long-term memories, this yeah. is what they used to sing all the time. Yes, yeah. And so she knew those words yeah. better than most of us. Yeah, but they didn't believe. And on that um, particular subject in terms of the family, um, I was thinking yeah. about also how the family can deny that something's wrong with mum. Because we're kind like that. Because everybody's had an um, odd Aunt Daisy. And old Aunt Daisy was probably dementing, or you know, they used to call, say senile. She had senile dementia, but you know, old Aunt Daisy yep. still lived with us, and she still lived in the community, and she still got to experience the the life and the culture of the family, and she wasn't left out because she was forgetful and odd. She she was still part of the family, and then the and family just. Uh, compensated. Yes, they compensated, and nobody said, "Oh, she's got. She needed a label." That's why I'm kind of a bit anti-labels now. Yes, mm -hmm. it is what it is, <coughs> but um, it is so what? what? So yeah. I get Alzheimer's. So the doctor tells me it's Alzheimer's. So what? Mm. Still have to like. There's a lot of time between still diagnosis and death. <coughs> yeah, it's still. So am I going to get fixated and and? Um, on it and not want to go out in case because I don't want to be that um, labelled. <coughs> I don't want to mm. be that clown up uptown who can't remember people or isn't dressed properly or and so whilst the brain can still work to some extent, people were like, I don't want people laughing at me, mm. so I'm just not going to do it. Yeah, but my role is really to get people out there doing it. Mm. Because the other part of it too is. Um, Sometimes it's the family saying, we don't want that embarrassment. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah so, we, so we don't take them. Like, my one of the groups that I um, take, what do you guys want to do? We want to go to the beach. When's the last time you went to the beach? We haven't been to the beach in years. Mm. Can't remember the last time I went to the beach. Probably when the kids were young. Yeah. Um, and it's a simple thing, and it's easy. And when you get them to the beach, you, you see what joy it brings. And, and to be fair, it's not like they get everything out of it because watching them get joy gives me joy. Yeah. Um, it's something as simple as a bush walk. Um, we're quite often up at Mount Holdsworth doing the Donnelly Flat mm. um, circuit or at Castle Point. Next week, I'm taking them to Lake Ferry um, just because they're normal, everyday things that they don't get to do. Yeah. One of my sisters said to me, 
How's mum? And I said to her, you know, girl, mum's great in her world. Mm. It's me who needs to change my view so that I can fit in some part of her world. I know. And that's a challenge. And that's why women, or I say woman nag, men nag too, but... Um, no. Uh, <laughs> trying to, and usually it's about trying to bring the person into reality, your reality. They can't do it. Yeah. You have to step into theirs. <clears throat> yeah. And let things slide. Yeah. And that, that's the challenge. Mm. Because I want my mum to be my mum. Mm, the one that, that, that I woman know. that raised me. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, but I have to come to that, that place where it's actually mum's in her world. Yes. And she's fine in her world. And she's not the woman that raised you anymore. No. And I have to change. Yeah. Yeah, change my thinking. But every my, now and then you still see glimmers of <laughs> yeah. who and she That brings was. back a really good smile. You know? Yes. I remember that. I remember that. So, you know, it's, it's about me for me. It's about me changing my perspective <laughs> Of what was and what is. Mm. Um, that's something. Where the other thing is that in order to nurse, in order to do this type of nursing, you have to be really prepared to nurse the family as well. You're not just nursing the person diagnosed; you nurse the family as well. And um, have no idea why I was even telling you this now. So that they can. There was a purpose to. Yeah. See, this is what it's like yeah. to be demented all the time. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you if I can see down the track. Focus. And yeah. <laughs> I promise it's not catchy. I haven't caught it. Um, I can't even remember where I was going with that. <laughs> ask guess, me another I, I guess with families, though, um, as you say, Anthony, it's um, the families go through that loss and grief process. And I guess if they know that mum has or dad has a diagnosis, they can have some things explained to them about how to deal with them at home or how to keep their life um, moving forward um, because I think if you have some strategies in place that you can support your, your whanau going through Alzheimer's, dementia, um, you feel like you're still able to help them in the way that they live and um, try and keep them living a purposeful life because I think that's important. Um, but also knowing that you do have to have that self-care as well. Going out to the beach, it's, um, I think a lot of people just like to go for a drive in a car. I, you know, you can drive around town and people in their older age like to say, oh, that, you know, that building's still there. Or, you know, uh, just a car trip is great for people um, with Oh, I dementia. know. And um, especially if they've lived in, uh, like the clients that I have that mm. have always lived in Mars and they'll tell you where something was yeah. <coughs> 50 years ago. Over here... There was a shoe shop and it was Charlie Brown's shoe shop or, and then they'd give you the history of Charlie Brown and his family. Yeah. Or, well, not even, it's not even that, just that. You go past the warehouse and you know how we learn by rote and we always were taught by rote. We're not now, but we were and they were. And they'll go, the warehouse, the warehouse. <laughs> yeah. As they see the big red shed. <laughs> yeah, it is, it, it is quite funny because, as you said, they'll, They'll go back and have something, a point of contact yeah, that they yes. can grasp onto. Oh, that's where I was going before. When I totally <laughs> lost the thread of it. Is that you? I have to know the person, not just who they are now, but who they were before. Mm. Because if if I'm meeting them for the first time and the only thing they have is the long term memory, I ha it's good to know that. Mm. Um, what they did for a living, who the family were, their, their quirks, if you like. Because when you get a diagnosis of dementia, and you know how we've all got quirks, so some of us are stubborn and some of us, we've all got our quirks, it's like throwing steroids at the quirk. So if I was always stubborn, I am totally stubborn now, you're not, there is no way you're going to get around me. So it takes creative thinking. And if you know who the person was and what the kind of things they like, you can get around them. And I like to be a winner too. I don't like to fail. So. <laughs> oh, no. So I don't like to have a person that I can't get around, but I have to know who the person was to know how I'm going to, what's my approach going to be. Mm. Um, and along with nursing the rest of the family, you actually end up, you get one person with a diagnosis and you might have three main players in the family. And by the time you've walked the journey with them and they may have gone into a rest home or passed away, you know so much about the entire family and the extended family. Um, and that makes that enables you to nurse them well. Yeah. 
it's when you don't bother to find out that when it, it, it will start to fall over at that point if you if you don't bother to find out who was this person and how might I convince them to do something they probably won't agree to, like and I guess, driving yeah. or <laughs> how can I convince them it's a good idea? Mm. And you, you really have to know their personality, learn their personality and, and find out about the person. Yeah, that, that sounds really cool uh, in terms of, as you said, the word identity, because in identity... We need to know our own identity as well Mm. so that we can be who we are Mm. and accept that. And if we don't know who they are, how can we add value to what they already have? Because it's like a scaffolding effect. Well, if I don't, I'm just another nurse that comes in and tells them what to do. Yeah. Um, And it's all in the approach. Nursing someone with dementia is all in the approach. It is actually. If I want to be a winner and I, I want Anthony to do something for me, then I will, if if I know Anthony, I will know that if I, a direct approach might work for you. Or, if I know a bit more about you, praising you up might be the thing that, mm. so I'll praise you. Because yeah. mm. I'm a winner, right? I don't, I don't want to be a loser. Yeah. I want you to do what I want you to do. And I want us to get there in the calmest possible way. Yeah. So if praising you to get what I want is what I need to do I'll be praising you and be saying oh Anthony and fling in the compliments and then I'll move in with the request <laughs> if that's your if that's your personality but yeah. um, you, you have to figure out what will make this person comply comply I love I love the way that um, when working with you Tam and, and some of our role with Anthony um, is education and um, supporting uh, carers or you know people in, in aged, aged care where they've only got a limited time to get things done they want to get all the showers done and all the you know they feel the pressure of doing that but um, you know you pointed out to me you know to get them to stop and think who was this person before they came into care um, what did they do what were their quirks um, you know what were the things that really um, excited them, um, what their interests were and things like that, because I think it's um, to get that empathy and be able to care for them in a in a kind and caring way, you have to have that empathy and you have to have a few minutes um, to learn about how that person ticks because, you know, as you say, um, if you know something that might trigger a, a good response, you'll be always trying to trigger that um, in conversation to get them to, um, to do things. Um, in a calm way because, um, yeah, you want to be able to manage them positively and feel yeah. good, yeah. And leave them in a, in a good space. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's really great in terms of getting to know the person, who they are and who and their value. Because as you said, Tam, if I'm just doing it because I just have to do it, um, doesn't really add value. Um, from mm. my perspective, yeah, it doesn't really add value. But, okay, when we get to know them, you know, we get to know who they are as a person. Mm, great. That sounds great. You've said a lot of things uh, today, Tam, and we really thank you for all the the insight that you've brought to our program today. <laughs> and as I said, I might have to um, have focus assist because there was times in the conversation where it was diminishing <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right but the thing is that the symptoms of someone with Alzheimer's are things we we have anyway like who doesn't get that anxiety when they lose their wallet and um, who doesn't lose their train of thought and who doesn't go through every of their kids' names before they hit the actual kid they're talking to. <laughs> um, not literally hit them, but, you know, get the right name for the right kid. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of those th- things, which are signs of dementia, they actually happen to us all through yeah. our lives. Yeah. It's when they happen more than they should yeah. or when the kid's name doesn't come to you. <laughs> <laughs> and five minutes later, you're saying, "What did I call that one?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. As you said, and that's one of the reasons why sometimes it's difficult to pick up in the early stages because yes, because we we all do it. We all do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just as you said, when we when the person's doing it more often, um, and it becomes 
a difficulty. Yeah, so so Alzheimer's New Zealand were doing a pamphlet and they were talking about how to know, uh, how, how to check if, if what was wrong um, was, should I should be taking myself to the doctor or what we were noticing. And it was like, if you do this, if you do that, there was about 10 things. And I did nine of the 10. And I said, <laughs> and they said it was in draft copy. And they said, how... What do you think of it? And I said, I think I'm dementing now. <laughs> I do all nine of those ten things. Yeah. Well, that's just it's scary. Thing. If yeah. you um, have a look at the, the mental health book and you go through it, there are things in there that you find you go start questioning yourself. Am I like this? I know. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Am I like this? So, anyway, thank you, Tam. This is we've come to the end of our, our program. I know it hasn't been very long, oh. has it? No, that well, no songs yeah, today. No songs today. <laughs> Maybe next time. But um, saying that next time um, on the sh- program, we're going to have um, Mike uh, Murray Henderson from the Wadarapa Community Law, and he's going to be speaking to us around some financial issues and also around wills and enduring power of attorneys, how to set that up, and the reason why we need to uh, have an enduring power of attorney. So once again. Thank you so much for today, Tim, and those on the airways. Thank you for listening to our program, and we'll see you in a month's time. Hey, Cornada.